Hello, and welcome to another interview with the experts. Today's interview is with Dr. Donna Marks. She has uh, been a licensed psychotherapist and addiction, addictions counselor in private practice in Palm Beach um, for over 30 years, and she's also a public speaker. She is the author of and a great, great book that I really recommend um, you get it if this is something that, you know, rings for you. Um, it's called Exit the Maze, One Addiction, One Cause, One Cure. I had the pleasure of meeting Donna recently, and um, and what struck me is that um, when she talked about addictions, it was not just about like substance abuse, which is what we normally relate to um, when we hear addictions. Um, she talks about all sorts of addictions. It could be gambling, it could be food, it could be um, going too much to the gym, it could be um, you know sex or cheating anything like that and um, so I have some really interesting um, uh, questions for her and, uh, and what we try to go into this interview was to talking about how beauty starts from from the heart and through self-love um, anything that you want to do you have to think that you are the most important person you will ever love and nothing else can happen unless you actually do that um, and how to choose love over fear, um, and uh, talk about you know eating for health and not comfort, which is you know how I personally found myself addicted to food and carbohydrates because I was eating for comfort, and I think we all do. You know, chocolate is never going to you know turn us down. So I really hope that you enjoy um, this interview, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Donna Marks and her website is uh, drdonnamarks.com. Doctor is just the initials DR, and I'm, go I'm going to be posting that at the end of this video. So enjoy. So, Donna, welcome to our interviews with experts. Very, very excited to speak with you. Ever since I met you, I've just been fascinated by what you do. And, um, and, uh, and, and yeah, that you, you really have so much to share with women in general about um you know self-love and and you know you specialize in in addictions and all that i think we all suffer from some sort of addictions one way or another um so i'm just gonna let you share with us what you want to just us as women to know go well i don't really want to focus on addiction although that's what my book exit the maze one addiction one cause and one cure is about um, what I would like to focus on, though, is that a lot of people have developed habits that become addictive, and it's nobody's fault. Mm. You know, there's no point in blaming ourselves or anybody else. But there's a void that people are often trying to fill. Mm. And uh, that void causes us to keep searching and seeking for things that actually aren't filling it. They're only growing the void bigger. And so, yes, the whole purpose of, of my mission, which is to help over 10 million people um, to recover from addiction in the next 10 years is to teach people that really what they're doing is they've, they've learned how to substitute love for comfort. And you can get both, but you're not going to get it in a substitute for love. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's um, after, you know, my own personal, you know, soul searching adventure and uh um and, and really embracing myself i really you know found a couple of addictions that i had and i think that for me well in, in the in the food part you know I, be, I i realized that i was very addicted to carbs and sugar um and then i was using food as a substitute for for a void as you said you know that you know that that was you know back in my 20s and 30s i was you know, never having the loving relationship I, I wanted. So, well, I'm sorry, but chocolate never betrays you. <laughs> it always feels so good. Well, chocolate isn't the addiction. Well, it's the sugar, <laughs> Chocolate's yeah. Chocolate's actually very good for you, for your hormones, for your brain. But it's the sugar in the chocolate that right. gets you. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. So, um, what can you tell us about, you know, what are we women most, um, you know, 
you know, you know, you know what I do is is I really love to. Um, my mission is to empower women to feel confident and elevate their self-esteem. And I use boudoir photography for that. And I approach it from the point of view that it's such a visual experience that when you see yourself looking absolutely beautiful, it really, I feel like your brain gets rewired. The more you see yourself beautiful and having these positive feelings, I feel that it really re rewires your neurons. So what do you think about that? I, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, you can take the most gorgeous, stunning woman in the world, and you know, a few of them have been called that. And when they are miserable and they go out, nobody sees them, they see misery. You can take a person who by, you know, beauty standards, yeah. <laughs> you know, Miss America or uh, Lady Clairol or something like that, um, who, you know, might not look so stunningly beautiful to that type of person, but when they go out and they're radiant and they're happy, they are the most beautiful person in the room. Mm -hmm. What do you So you're right, it comes from within. When you let your light shine, mm -hmm. and we all have it, then beauty shines through. Mm -hmm. So from your knowledge and your experience, you know, speaking to so many women and helping so many women, why does that happen? Why can you have a woman that is absolutely gorgeous, but she just doesn't feel worthy, she doesn't feel attractive, and then you can have just an average girl, you know, I happen to have in the studio sometimes girl that, you know, they're plus size, and, and they just feel that they're just, they're just so comfortable with who they are. What happened, what's the difference? Well, the difference is um, often that someone who is miserable has had a lot of trauma mm -hmm. or they're going through something painful and they haven't resolved that trauma. And I talk about how it's that trauma that causes that wound or that void to form to begin with. So maybe it's something that happened early on or maybe it's something recent like a betrayal or some type of assault, um, some type of huge loss, and um, they're feeling that. So. Many people don't know how to work through their trauma. And part of the, the cure for any type of addiction is healing that wound and filling that void with self-love. So someone who does feel uh, that self-love, who does take care of themselves, they're not putting that on anyone else. They're not putting it on society to determine what they look like. They might inform themselves of the things that accentuate beauty versus things that don't accentuate beauty. I mean, if I put, um, well, I don't even want to go there because I was going to say, if I put polka dots all over my face, <laughs> that may not be so beautiful, but to some people it may. So yeah. beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. But the point is that the person feels beautiful from within, that there's an inner peace, an inner knowing, an inner confidence. And that comes by um, not having unresolved issues within and tapping into our spiritual nature, our, our true nature, which is a loving being. We are born in, in, you know, as loving beings to love and share and receive it. And so uh, when, we, when we are restored to that state, whatever beauty uh, is there shines forth. Mm -hmm. What do you tell um, a person when she just say, says, I just hate my body? I just hate my body, I don't like it, doesn't matter what I do, I never lose weight, or it has an odd shape, you know, what What do you tell her? Yeah, well, the first thing she has to do is get rid of that word, mm. because um, we, we have become much too uh, emphasized, and it's no, again, it's nobody's fault, but from the moment we come out into the environment, we're getting bombarded with, you have to be this thin, or you have to be this weight, or you have to look this color of hair and this color, da, 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 da. and if you're not using this kind of makeup and you're not wearing these kinds of clothes and you don't have this kind of body, you, you subliminally and sometimes directly get those messages. And you know, most movie stars are, you know, golden amorous and perfect. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, and so when we look at somebody who's got the figure and we look in the mirror and we see the lumps and the bumps and the sags, it's like, oh, you're ugly. Yeah. And that is the farthest thing from the truth. Yeah. That is not the truth. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder and you are the most important beholder of your beauty. Mm -hmm. So if you're focusing on 
your body, you're never going to be satisfied. There are people who are so addicted to their bodies that they can never get skinny enough. They can never have enough plastic surgery. They can never put enough whatever to it. And they're never satisfied. They can have the body of the perfect model Mm -hmm. and they would not be satisfied because their mind would focus on the one little wrinkle or the one little cellulite or something Mm -hmm. and it would never be enough. So this would definitely fall into the addiction category, right? Yes. And it's also a big illusion. The reason women are so concerned about it is because of men. They think that they're not going to be sexy or attractive to a man if their body's not perfect. Mm -hmm. And men are a lot less focused on the body than we think. Uh, Most men who, what kind of man I would want anyhow, the kind of man you would want, Mm -hmm. are more focused on an emotional connection Mm -hmm. and a true bond. And then you look like the most beautiful woman in the world to that man as he is to you. Right. Yeah, I would say my clients, when they tell me, um, specifically when, when they just focused in, in one particular partner, that they're not getting, you know, he's not wanting me back, you know, he's cheated on me, you know, I, I don't like anybody else. And I tell them, like, think of it of, of this, like in, in this way. Does it really matter what your partner looks like as long as you feel amazing when you are with him? And yes. you well, know, when someone cheats on you, that's the most debilitating thing that could ever happen because not only does it make you feel worthless and ugly and less than, you've been betrayed. Betrayed, yeah. So what, what causes betrayal? You know, I tell women, he didn't cheat on you, he cheated on himself. If he was dissatisfied in the relationship, he should have addressed it with you. If he did address it with you and you chose not to correct it, then you need to look at yourself. Not your beauty, but what is blocking you from hearing someone who loves you or loved you or you love, you're not being able to hear what what they're, they're saying. But in many cases, men are not bringing it up sometimes they're afraid to talk every time they bring things up they they feel like they're being uh, Mm -hmm. attacked so we have to be soft and permeable and approach conflicts Mm -hmm. either when we're sharing a conflict we do it with love or when we receive it we request that the person give it to us with love not all this it's your fault your fault your fault kind of thing but a betrayal uh, and cheating is is not the person's fault that the person has who's cheating has cheated themselves mm-hmm. the second part of this is that relationships rarely last forever and mm-hmm. one of the things i love about the course in miracles it says mm-hmm. that the relationship will last for as long as there's growth oh my god when the so maximum sh- amount of learning has occurred it can it will naturally change form now where we get hung up is i don't want it to change form I want him to stay my husband. I want him to stay my lover. I want him to stay my boyfriend. Mm -hmm. But then we're not understanding that there's something better for us. Mm -hmm. So if we let go and we let go with love and we don't attack and blame, we do have to have time to heal our wounds. Mm -hmm. But something is that relationship will not be lost. There are people who still are very close friends, even though they went through hell and a divorce. Mm -hmm. When I'm counseling couples, I encourage them to go through the whole grieving process together it is so beautiful then they get their divorce together then they remain best friends it's a beautiful thing as opposed to getting into all the horrors of of an ending of a relationship when someone's deeply deeply hurt they do need time to heal and they do need to acknowledge Mm -hmm. their wounds and they shouldn't just gloss over them but they don't have to internalize it that they're ugly or that they're not appealing enough that is rarely true yeah, I, I totally agree with you that, you know, I tell my uh, when clients tell me, yeah, my husband left me for a 25-year-old after 35 years of marriage. She's like, look, he didn't leave you because you were getting old or you were ugly. He told you because he's an asshole. <laughs> he left you because he's a, an asshole. You know, he, he it's not your fault, you know, because as you said, yeah. he should have addressed it. He cheated, you know, himself. Right. And, and we are so right. prone to, to, we've been made to believe that it's our fault. If a man goes and looks somewhere else, it's because we're not giving them what they need or we're letting ourselves go. Um, or, but but you, you're right, I think it's because the growth stops. And, and now when you put it that way, you know, it just click on me 
um, that uh, that's exactly what happened to me, you know, in, the, in most of my relationships. Um, I just, wow. uh, you know, I, I picked men that were never really in the path of personal growth, and I'm uh, like in 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 like in a train. You right. know, fast right. train in the of, of personal growth. <laughs> You're not on the steps. You're in the no, deep end. <laughs> no. We're, I'm not even like cruising. I'm like going like very, very intense with very, you know, steep curves and heels and sharp changes and, and all that because I'm just not afraid. Um, you know, change is always uncomfortable, but I don't avoid it. You know, I know that to grow, there has to be some change. And, um, and not knowing myself really, you know, that's what took me to, to pick the partners that I, that I did. There's nothing wrong with them. Um, uh, they're good men, all of them. Uh, but now I understand, you know, when I started to feel disconnected and yes, at that moment I started to blame it on them. Um, but it was because the growth stopped, you yeah. know, and, um, you know, and, and, and it made me realize that, um, you know, until I find somebody that is in the same path of personal growth where we can together be growing, I, you know, it, it's just going to be the same cycle, you know, over yeah. and over. And yeah. do you think some women get addicted to their bad marriage? Oh, I think that bad relationships can be very addictive. They're like roller coaster rides, and they're either really good or really bad, or that they're so codependent on their partner that the thought of uh, living without that person is, you know, mm -hmm. unconsciously unbearable. And so they cling on for dear life when um, they would be so much better off to be free mm -hmm. and to be able to, you know, find relationships that are meaningful and, and loving. Absolutely. What what are the things that would stop them? I mean, if if you really have an abusive, you know, husband, or somebody that really doesn't respect you or doesn't share the expense, doesn't do what a husband should do, like help with the kids. He instead goes and as soon as Friday is, is here, he goes with his friends and and leaves you at home raising the kids by yourself. So it's basically living separate lives, but you stay there. You know, what is it that a woman would need in order to actually come out of that? Well, she would need to decide to love herself. Uh, and it's not loving to tolerate uh, a relationship I, that's not satisfying. I, to me, a relationship is a we program, not a me program. Meaning it's not his program or her program, it's a, it's a we. And then when there's children, it's we family. Mm -hmm. And we all have to work together to serve one another and to be of service to each other and to grow together. So what happens in the type of relationship that you just, just described is that um, it starts off long ago and maybe he had a little temper tantrum and she was afraid to say, don't you dare talk to me like that ever again. Mm -hmm. She tolerated it. And then so he does it again. And then he does it again, and it escalates and escalates. And, and each time he's escalating his anger or his abuse or his, I'm going out for the weekend or whatever he's doing, and she tolerates it, they both become desensitized to how wrong it is. Mm -hmm. And then the fear sets in. Well, you know, he, he, he's not doing this, this, and this, but at least I'm getting this, this, and this. The compromise sets in. Mm -hmm. The justification, the rationalization, keeping the pain numbed out so sometimes a woman like that will find her own life or she'll develop the substitute for the romance and the love that she's not getting from her mm -hmm. spouse or maybe she is getting that from him but all of the other things are missing mm -hmm. there's not a really true safe and i mean safe emotional connection so yes it becomes addictive but it's based on fear not love i'm afraid to move out of this what I try very hard when I'm working with women like this is to say, you must love yourself and you must learn to speak your truth, but speak it from love. What happens is women either clam up and hold it in or they blow it out like a fire dragon. And if you hold it in, you're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to get depressed and become less and less appealing to yourself, let alone the relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you blast the guy, that's not going to serve any purpose. Nobody wants to be blasted. 
you don't like being yelled at. <laughs> he doesn't like it either. <laughs> so you begin to say things like, I'm very concerned about this marriage. I love you with all my heart. You point out the things that you did love about the person. And then you say, I don't feel like the, the balance in this relationship is what I'd like it to be. I'm not going to be yelled at anymore. I'm not going to be left alone on the weekends anymore. I'm willing to get some help with you. I'm not going to say you're at fault. I don't care about blaming. I care about getting our marriage on track. Are you with me or not? Mm -hmm. What if he just like doesn't say a word? Because I feel he that he may when... not say a word. Yeah. He may just need to take it in for a while, and in. then you have to get into action with it. Uh huh. I'll give you some time to think about it, but we need to talk about this because I'm not willing to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel that um, I remember one relationship that I had, you know, I was afraid to actually do something like that because I was afraid that he would leave me if I would yes. force him to actually look into his inside and, and work on through his own issues, he would right. leave me. And that was... Right. You know, I didn't want to be left. You just said two things that everybody thinks. You can't lose somebody you don't have. Yeah. So he's already left you if you don't have him. If, you, if you're not connected emotionally and romantically and somewhat spiritually, you don't have him anyhow. So he's mm -hmm. already gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the second thing is, I said, I, I need to force him to look at himself. No, you don't force anybody to look at themselves. You're saying, I'm looking at myself. Mm -hmm. And I'm not willing to live like this anymore. Are you with me or not is different than saying you have to do this and you have to do that. Mm -hmm. And then if he says, well, what do you want? You better be prepared. Have it already written down. Yeah. If you're going to go away on the weekends, I want to know where you're going and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I, I feel very unsafe. You're just walking out the door on Friday night and strolling back in on Sunday. That's not a marriage. Right. I want us to, to share the responsibilities around here. Mm -hmm. I feel like a maid. I'm not living like that anymore. Mm -hmm. It's not comfortable for me. Mm -hmm. I want to share the weekends with you. Mm -hmm. I love you and enjoy spending time with you. And, you know, be prepared that he may really like it that you're doing this or he may not like it. But you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it would have finally um, have my, my own... Um, relationship breakthrough was uh, my third marriage because I was married three uh -huh. times you know I am a strong believer in marriage you know that even if yeah, it didn't work too, you know it. yeah keep doing it until you get it right and having children I yeah. had to really work on that addiction that yeah. was my last one yeah. it's a numbers game you know I make sure that get it right yeah. yes but you know you've got to forgive yourself and never yeah. give up and you keep working on yourself yeah and I, I'm so blessed now with a mm -hmm. wonderful marriage yeah so yeah, we don't but, give up. Mm -hmm. It would have been real easy for you or I to say, no more. I'm mm -hmm. done with relationships. And that's what a lot of people do after they've had several or quadruple failed relationships or marriages. They say, right. I'm unworthy of this and I'm not going to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Never, never, never give up. Ever, mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, when I decided to get divorced the third time, you know, it, it was the time when I felt that I did. I, I did it in a very self-loving way that um, I sat down with myself and said, what is it do I, that I really want? What is it that I really want him to do? And I'm like, okay. I, and I wrote the list. Like, you're going to come home on the weekend or after uh -huh. finish your call or you're not going to be on call. You're going to stay on call with me, not with your mother. And right. you're going to pay your debts or we're going to sit down and do our bills together every month and manage our finance. So it was like, it's like I'm not going to be hinting at you. Here is a list of things that yes. I want to you. <laughs> written down, answer. written down. And then another list of the things that I wouldn't tolerate. And, um, and, and, and you know, the, the years went by and, um, and I gave him fair warnings. Okay, this is strike one. This is the kind of things that you just like walk all over me and I'm not going to tolerate. Strike through and you're out. Then strike two happened. And so like, okay, I'm just letting you know this is strike two. This is absolutely, I don't know, I'm not going to take it a third time. So at time strike three came, obviously he had nothing to say. He had nothing to say and he just packed and left. Oh. <laughs> wow. And so it's like, 
you know, I wonder if he did it on purpose, but he was, because he didn't have the guts to tell me in my face. I yeah. was just well, he may have thought he may have just realized he couldn't do whatever it was that you wanted. Right. And a lot of times, um, people, uh, men or, or women, they have addictions, and they they try to stop. The the, the spouse doesn't understand addiction, mm -hmm. and they don't understand that they can't help themselves without getting some type yeah. of help. Yeah, so I try to yeah. help people to you know approach it like. Usually by the time they come to see me, they are so burnt out on the mm -hmm. situation that they, I don't want to do that. I don't want to tell him he's not going to do this. She's not going to do that. But when people still love each other and they see the good in the person mm -hmm. and they see that the person earnestly does want to get better, mm -hmm. then that can be a beautiful journey together. But it takes two. It takes two. And it, it sounds like two. in this case, he just could not. Come no, on. no. At the end, I think um, because I had you know huge deal breakers, and it was him stopped drinking, not even uh -huh. eggnog or you know nothing. Look, it's uh -huh. like it's. He would tell me, I just drink just once in a while. Like, I'm sorry, but this is a deal breaker for me. I've seen you drunk. You have an addiction. This is a no, no. You can't control yourself. And yeah. um, and and he's That's finances. That's the problem with addiction that hijacks the mind and, right. and people. Once you're hijacked, you don't want to come down to earth. Right, and then you know, right. for me to get mad about something else, then he yeah. messed up with the finances. So have something distract me from his drinking. So uh, the end is like you know is it, I'm not gonna take that and 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 I think he was just looking to like you know I'm not gonna stop drinking and I'm not gonna stop gambling or whatever he was doing with his money so so he had nothing to say he just walked away he was probably relieved and you know i had to recognize who the hell am i to force this man to be something he doesn't want to be right and and right. the only thing that i had to say is he did hide his drinking from me otherwise i would have never marry him by the time i realized he was a alcoholic it was too late so i had to like okay let's try to make this work um and yeah. a, and a, I, I didn't want to give up on him. I went to counseling and everything, and uh, oh, and at the end, sounds very painful. It was, it was because for uh -huh. me there was a lot of shame about being divorced for the third time. Right. And um, it was in my, you know, close to forty-four or forty-three, and and I really, you know, um, I, I really wanted to have, you know, an amazing relationship with him and. It's my last uh -huh. chance to probably have... You saw the vision. I saw the vision, yes. And, yeah. and we actually did share the vision, um, but he wasn't doing the work. Yeah. So, and, and I have That's to say, painful. it was out so of... It's very painful when yeah, cause somebody wants to and, and you and see that. And the other to, person doesn't, yeah. And, uh, and it was an act of self-love and self-respect that I finally said, like, wait a minute, I am worthy whether I'm married or not. Because in right. my head, I had to be married, otherwise I was an outcast for my family and society. Uh, uh, Being a single woman here in Mexico um, is it, like a threat. Uh, oh, you know, or childless woman in her 50s, you know, oh, you're going to pour, you know, die alone, go and adopt a kid or rescue. Like, they're not dogs, I'm going to rescue a kid. Like, you're crazy. <laughs> That's what my mother would tell me. <laughs> I said, like, I am worthy by myself. I do not need a husband to validate my worthiness. And it was yeah. uh, one of the biggest acts of love that, that I had to, to make for myself. And it's what I try to, you know, convey my clients. Um, but Don, explain to, to us why some women can actually, you know, from a young age, because... You know, one day we wake up and we're 40 and how the hell did I get myself here? You know, low self-esteem, low he bad health, bad relationship or divorce or in a bad marriage. And then um, what were we lacking that we actually put up with all that and other women? It's just that at least in my case, I didn't have a good role model. My mother wasn't exactly the, the role model of self-esteem and, and uh, teaching us how to be respected by men. She was like, you better lose weight, otherwise the man is going to marry you. You know, that, oh was, that was all we heard. Instead of like, don't take any bullshit from men. You're worth it. You can do it alone. And you're not going to, you know, you know, 
uh, put up with anything for even you. Better, you know, you're a great woman and you'll attract a great man. That's right. all you need to hear. <laughs> so exactly. So does that really matter if, if, if a girl, you know, has a mother that would actually, what would it take for a woman to actually jump into her adult life and in making the decisions out of self-love and self-respect? What are the things that she has or she might not, that doesn't have that messes up her life and something about life? Yeah, well, first of all, if a, if a mother is telling a daughter that she has to be a certain way in order to get a certain thing, she's already saying, you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. You're not uh, worth somebody's time and attention and commitment unless you are blank. And that mm -hmm. is teaching a child that they are not good enough and that their worth is not enough. And that is not that the motive isn't bad. The motive is I want you to have a husband and I want you to you know, have all the good things in life. That's the motive, mm -hmm. but they're going about it in the wrong ways. <laughs> right. <laughs> Usually a parent who says that kind of thing to her daughter has been told the same thing herself. Right. And then if you've been raised like that, then um, the ego, the damaged ego, not the healthy ego uh, of mm -hmm. a good self-esteem, but the damaged ego from a poor self-esteem so constantly sees evidence of that. Well, this guy left his wife for a younger woman. This guy left his wife for a thinner woman. Everybody's married but me. I'm getting divorced. You know, all the negativity keeps keeps it intact. All on a false premise that you have to look a certain way to find a guy, which is utterly insane and ridiculous. What you need to find a really good guy is to have it together. Mm -hmm. And that means you love yourself, you respect yourself, and everything else falls into place. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, most of my clients are 40 and up, and uh, I would say half and half, half are single, half are married, and uh, and a lot of my clients in their 50s, I, I, I have women come into the studio and they're these beautiful, successful, super achiever women. They're independent, they have their shit together, their finances, they're working on themselves, they invest in themselves, they're, they're just happy, they're just full of life. And then they tell me about their boyfriend. And I'm like, why? Why are you dating this guy that in three weeks is living in your house and he's just a drummer and he is... 50. Why would we do that? Well, I think that goes probably deeper than what we can get into today, but that probably has to do with, again, self-esteem issues that started off in childhood and that she's become so uh, independent and lonely mm -hmm. that she's settling for someone that she doesn't need to settle for. Uh, there's also the fear of lack. You know, we've all, and it's not just our looks that have conditioned us. It's the age thing. You know, mm -hmm. if you're not under a certain age, you're no longer marketable. Well, that's also totally ridiculous. When I was in my 50s, I had more fun dating than I ever had when I was younger because I had confidence. Yeah. There is never a lack of people. Uh, and if you're, if you're not dating someone or you're not in the dating realm, there's so many wonderful people just to get to know and enjoy. It doesn't have to be about finding the relationship. Mm -hmm. Just find some relationships, and women are the best place to start. That's true. In terms of friendships. Yeah. I don't mean having romantic. Yeah, yeah, I friendship. Mean, the friendship. Yeah. Getting involved. You know, have a relationship with yourself. What mm -hmm. have you always wanted to do that you've never done before? Mm -hmm. And then do it dance lessons, art lessons, reading classic literature, traveling. I mean, there's just a million things that you could do, go to concerts, but mm -hmm. women who are professional are working, 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 and they're just getting um, into that loneliness and that uh, vulnerability. You can become so vulnerable from the isolation that you're not getting fulfillment. So the first guy that says the right thing or does the right thing, we get hooked. You get hooked, emotionally mm -hmm. hooked, that uh, dopamine, yeah. my God, that dopamine. <laughs> yeah, that's it, the dopamine. Yeah, 
and especially after a while of being single and then you you know somebody pays attention to you and makes right. you feel that like you're the right things pushes the right buttons yeah exactly the right buttons i mean the the men know this i mean because i uh, here, here's another a couple of things that had happened um that I've heard of some of my clients or people that I just talked to on the phone. They're very easy play, prey to um, to, to con, cat, uh, um, con, con artists. Like uh, I remember one time this lady, beautiful, you know, African American lady, very voluptuous, voluptuous, but she was just so confident in her body. And she was taking these pictures for her boyfriend. It's like, oh my God, that's so great. Where does he live or what does he do? It's like, oh, he is a professional soccer player in a team in Africa. He is from whatever African country. Oh, how do you meet him? Oh, we never met in person. We met online. He's going to be here shortly. Meanwhile, he needs money for the tickets to get here. Yeah. <laughs> well, not, not that. She was going to actually go visit him. And then there was an old lady that she actually was going to go all the way to Hong Kong to marry him so she could bring him to America. You never met this okay. man. So is that low lack of self-confidence, lack of self-value or worthiness? I think that it's fear of lack. Yeah. Fear of lack. Yeah. Rather than just enjoying my life and waiting for it to come to me, for him to, to meet the right person, I'm enjoying my life so much. If I meet him, fine. If I don't meet him, fine. And I'm not going to be looking for it, so to speak. I mm -hmm. hope it happens, but I'm not going to be looking for it. And I'm having so much fun living my life mm -hmm. that I'm not vulnerable. Mm -hmm. I'm not vulnerable to that. So and I'm also paying attention. So you think like, just feeling incomplete? Have, like, what are your priorities in a relationship? And if the guy, if, if your priority is someone successful and he's not working, that's <laughs> right there. Friend. Maybe friend, mm -hmm. maybe, probably not because you may not have much in common because mm -hmm. he's got a lot of free time and you don't. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have the income that you do to do the things together that require, you know, money. So yeah, maybe yeah. Not even friend. absolutely. So how does a woman can work on herself on these issues? Because I help them through photography, which is very visual and, yes. and, and, and that just helps you a lot to actually have an it's almost like jumping out of an airplane and then somebody takes a picture and yes you are jumping off an airplane it's like oh my god if i can jump off an airplane what else can i do so yes. it's getting yourself out of the comfort zone what are the benefits of a woman getting out of her comfort zone um and and the things that she can do uh to actually really get herself unstuck i just hear that word i just feel stuck with my life I think the first thing that people have to do is understand if they have a low self-esteem or if there's some kind of underlying void, that that has to be addressed. So that wound needs to be addressed. And again, not to blame anybody, but to understand what happened and then to grieve it, to feel the, the feelings about whatever happened to cause that. It's not enough just to know that maybe I was abused or, or I, I was traumatized or I was raised that I wasn't good enough. There's emotion that's stuck there because when a young woman is told that she has to be a certain way to get a certain guy or something like that, that was painful. Mm -hmm. Something really hit, shot right through your core of, of your self-love. So that needs to be addressed and felt and mm -hmm. felt. And, and that's what therapy does. That's what the workshops and seminars that you and I talk about, that's what they do is really mm -hmm access that wound and drain it of the pain and trauma that's been bottled up inside. Mm -hmm. And then to learn how to love yourself, which means you would never, ever, ever say anything like that to your own little girl. Yeah. So you would never, ever, ever say anything like that to yourself. Mm -hmm. And when you wake up in the morning, you wrap yourself in your big comfy blankie and you look out the window and you're grateful whether it's raining or it's sunny, it's nature taking care of the planet. And when you feed yourself, you feed yourself with really healthy, delicious food, not because it's comfortable, but because it's nourishing your wonderful body. Mm -hmm. And you want to take care of your body because it feels good to do that. And then if you exercise or when you're getting dressed or when you're bathing, you're really experiencing that. Just like a baby's 
playing in the tub, you know, and mm-hmm. wee wee, and they're yeah. splashing water, and you stay <laughs> in that childlike and really enjoy taking care of your body and your mind and meditating and music and walks and appreciation. And uh, when I when I do the workshops, I really get people into an individualized self love program. Mm-hmm. It's not something we can just cover in five minutes. It starts with the minute you're born. You're either mm-hmm. feeling it or you're not. There's either, um, uh, you know, no mother is perfect, but it's got to be good enough. Yeah. So if, if there was problems, we, we just look at where the gaps are and learn how to fill them in. If there was huge traumas, then we have to do some deeper work. Mm-hmm. But it, no matter what happened, no matter what happened, I was born into addiction and abuse, and I was able to get completely healed and healthy. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't want to be addicted to anything anymore. That's the cure. But it no longer appeals to me to do something that isn't good for me. Mm-hmm. It's not like I could be pulled into it anymore because it's just like, no, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. Feels too good. This happiness, this feels too good. And yes, yeah. traumatic things happen, but because I'm approaching them with love, it has a whole different outcome. Yeah. Yeah, I actually... Um... I, I, you know, I always struggle with, with my weight and it was because I was very addicted. You know, the, the diet in Mexico is full of carbohydrates uh-huh. and, and it's, you know, I had no education about nutrition whatsoever. Uh-huh. So the only way that I knew how to lose weight was to starve myself. Uh-huh. And, um, but when I educated myself, you know, about what food does to you and it's like, oh, it's sugar. That is your cravings. That's why. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. And, uh, uh, and, and yeah, so I did a, a carbohydrate cleans the sugar. Oh my God, what a headache. Oh my yeah, God. It was a headache. It was withdrawal. the withdrawal. And oh my God, it was like, just give me a piece of bread, a potato. I don't care something. And it, it was, it, it was like amazing, you know, unbelievable. No, it's, and, it, no matter what the withdrawal is, I don't care if it's relationship, gambling, food, sex, it's the same physical and emotional symptoms. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, you just want that fix. And that kind of wakes people up too. Oh yeah. my God. Yeah. I really was, you know, addicted to this. Right. I didn't know it. And, uh, and I think it's, it's when, when you learn to, um, to start loving yourself, you, you do things from a very different point of view. And oh, I, yeah. I, in particular, um, after I lost the weight, um, it, it was a um, few years later when I started to do what I did my own session, you know, really fell huh. in love with, with my body, what, what I look like. And I was feeling so good. I wasn't craving that food because right. I had my fix of feeling good. Right. Right. And, um, and I, you know, I didn't, I'm not going to tell you I lost a ton of weight, but I became from a size 14 to a size 12 without doing nothing. And with a healthy body and a healthy mind. Yes. That's the key. That is not the key. pounds, but you, you're eating for emotional and physical health. Right. Not to fill the void. That's the key. Yeah. And, um, yeah, of course, you know, I still love food and, and sometimes it's like, oh, some ice cream. And it's like, you know what? I'm not going to do that rush of sugar into my pancreas. It's like, no, I'm not going to eat the whole thing. And, but I do it out of love for my body, not to uh-huh. be skinny or be loved or wanted, which yeah. is the, the point that I try to make to my clients yeah. that, well, first I'm going to go and get a tummy talk. Um, and I want to surprise my, my boyfriend with these pictures. It's like, no, 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 no. I'm all about doing surgery for your body after having children is no different than fixing your car after a crash. Of, of course. You, you need to take care of your body. So absolutely, go fix it. But not to be loved and wanted. Do right. it for yourself. Yeah. And, um, exactly. and it was really until I started to love myself truly that I started actually to date better. Yes. And, and I found myself saying no to a lot of men. <laughs> Right. I was, what yes. a difference. Yes. What a difference. Yes, yes because you're, you've learned how to seek the fulfillment for yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he, he is no longer just an object of fulfillment. Then you are a whole person and you're going to attract people who are also whole. Yeah. So, um, mm-hmm. 
So tell us about your, more your, um, you know, your retreats, Donna. How, how you help women? I mean, I, I have so many women that, that, you know, are in my mailing list and we all have different story and we come from different places and we all have our own struggles. Um, what do you offer? So I do the same that I teach in my book, but reading a book isn't going to get somebody, you know, where they want to be. It's the right. beginning. It opens people up. I had a woman come up to me today. She said, I've been looking for you. I was in a meeting. She said, I've been looking for you. I've been asking around for you. I just got your book. And she started crying. She said, I realized so much and that I didn't realize about why I became addicted. And um, it, just, it, it just made me feel so good. But that's just the beginning, the realization. Mm -hmm. um, I do have exercises in there. But when I do a retreat, it's about building a community and a community of, uh, for a women's retreat, a community of women mm -hmm. who are going to provide safety and trust within that workshop and in that retreat. And then we're going to go back in time and understand what happened. How did this all begin? It didn't begin with this guy mm -hmm. or this particular situation. It began long ago to understand what happened. And then I give them the exercises and the tools, whether it's meditation, guided imagery. I'm a gestalt therapist. Um, so I have all kinds of um, tools, psychodramas that help people to really access that emotional pain. So we want to rid ourselves of that. And that's a lifelong process, but we can get the big, massive clump of it out in these retreats right. often. Um, sometimes people need a little more time, but just yeah. planting the seed is enough. Right. And then to be able to, um, I teach people, each person has like a, develops an individualized plan on what it would look like from the moment they wake up, from the moment they go to sleep at night, if they were practicing self-love. Yeah. In my book, I have one little thing that's so much fun. It's um, called the Jar of Hearts. Uh -huh. And um, I have everybody buy a jar. Mm -hmm. It's empty. And I suggest a big one. <laughs> and then um, I give them red. This one of the exercises I do in the workshops. I give them red hearts. I mean, I give them red construction paper and black construction paper. And I say, now cut up strips of the black construction paper and fill the jar with those you know, wad them up like in balls. So they're like black balls symbolizing that black hole inside of us, you know, yeah. that, that sucks every, sucks our self-esteem and all the love and, you know, everything that, that void that we're trying to fill. So here's this jar full of this void of blackness. Uh -huh. Every time you love yourself, you're going to take the red construction paper and make a heart and you're going to take out a black piece and put in a heart. So if mm -hmm. in the morning you wake up and you remember to, to wrap that blanket around you and just take a few moments to say, I love you so much. Just like you are a little tiny baby. I love you so much. Yeah. I'm so glad you're here. Yeah. Put a heart in there. When you remember to eat something that's really good for you, put a heart in there. When you do some service work to help somebody else, that's an act of self-love. Yeah. Anytime you're sharing love, you're receiving it. A heart in there. When you're, um, when you're trying to stop an addiction and you're not doing it for that day, another heart. And eventually, you have a jar of red hearts, and you go, oh, my God, I actually have learned Set love. how to love myself. Yeah. And I've replaced all that dark yuck with red love. And, you know, it's, it's a metaphor, and it's a little corny, but it yeah. works really well because yeah. it's like you can see it right in front of you. Wow. You know, it's like we get to be kids, and we get to learn how to do what we weren't taught. Yeah, it's like what, winning up. That's uh, the main part of it. That's it. The, the healing. That yeah. uh, first of all, to 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 address what happened, to heal what happened, and then to replace that void with self love. Yeah, it's it's uh, we all lo love to win and accomplish a project. So it's almost we become our own projects. Yeah, I think exactly. that a lot of us women, because we we need projects. We, yes. we make our partner a project right. and he's like, yes. it's our responsibility to fix him and, and all that. Right. And, and, and uh, like you said, that's the addiction that's rather addiction. than wait a minute. Every time I think about what he needs to do, I'm going to pull it back on myself and take care of myself. Take care of myself. Like a rock band. And, and, back to me. and I think Donna, that a lot of the times we don't do that because we're so, um, uh, predisposed to, put ourselves last. Yes, Otherwise, exactly. if we put ourselves first, we're being selfish. We have yeah, to take care of cultural, um, cultural messages, with religious messages, and um, we have to create a more loving message. 
Yeah, it's always take care of your husband. Our role as women in relationships. Which, yeah. yeah, and um, why do we fear so much putting ourselves first? And what does it look like? Because I think that a lot of people, women might think that putting yourself first is being that you spend all the money on you and you don't take care of your children. That's not it. So when you have a, a woman that is putting herself last, you know, is just so drained, you know, how do you teach her to start putting herself first? What does it look like that it doesn't seem like you, you feel guilty about it and like you feeling uh, selfish? Well, and they tell us every time we get on a plane, what do they tell you? Put your seatbelt on before you help, or your, your mask, your ma you know, your mask, your oxygen mask. If, if you have a child, who gets the mask first? You do. Right. Because dead Why? no good to him. <laughs> Why? You because get if you can't be, you can't help your child through anything if you're not alive. Yeah. Same thing. And it's not that, that it be, I, I don't, I'm not encouraging people to, to dismiss anybody else's needs or wants mm -hmm. because it is a we program. But you have to, um, you're going to, you know, one of the things I, I, I teach is that the most important person you will ever love is yourself. Mm -hmm. And everything is a reflection of that. So if someone is treating you badly, that is a reflection of what you've taught them to do, which you wouldn't have never taught them to do that if you loved yourself. Mm -hmm. You would have taught them to love you, or they would have moved in and out of your life. Yeah. Okay. So your retreats, how many days are they? Oh, I have all different kinds. One day, two day, three days. Okay. Who's the most popular? And that can be, well, usually it depends. If somebody's just, in, you know, checking in for information, you know, and they don't really want to get deep into it. Um, like we have some things locally here just to kind of, you know, my mission is to save 10 million lives in the next 10 years. So yeah. I'm approaching it from every angle. But I'm willing to do customized for, you know, if somebody wanted a longer one uh, and I can manage my schedule to do even longer than three days, I'm willing to do that. But the average is like three days three for days. really, you know, people who are really wanting to get in there and do some deeper work. I believe in full immersion. So yes. three days yes. sounds fantastic. Now right. tell us the name of your book. Exit the Maze, One Addiction, One Cause, One Cure. And it's about available on Amazon.com. Yes, and I'm going to put the wonderful link. reviews. We had a big party on Saturday. Oh, ah, yeah, that's you know, right. Everybody said, we're in for the mission. Yes. That was great. Yes. Wonderful testimonials. We're going to we're getting ready to release some videos and, uh, mm -hmm. about um, uh, the benefits that people have gotten from this approach. Mm -hmm. Because traditionally addiction is, okay, you got a problem, you go to treatment, you got, get released. And my theory is that's totally inadequate. Really? Um, okay. Yes. You know, somebody needs to, to go through detox, regardless of what addiction it is, to understand what's happening to them, to learn about addiction, what are their triggers, what causes relapses, um, to understand what it is. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as a disease. I, I just consider it that one void, and it wants to plug in wherever it can. So um, treatment often doesn't address that. It just says, oh, you have an alcohol problem, don't drink anymore, and here's, how, here's the meetings to go to. But I, I address it from the perspective that void is going to, it's like a hose, an invisible hose, and it's going to hook up to anything it can to fill that void. So we've got to heal that void. Right. And then uh, then the, the desire to, to self-destruct goes away. This isn't, this doesn't feel good. I don't like it. Mm -hmm. so I don't like it. I don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. So your book is a good place to start with somebody yeah. that wants to work on yeah. herself, you know, and then from there, your information would be in that book. Either want to yeah. reach out to you and, and uh, maybe come to one of your retreats. Yeah, drdonnamarks.com. I have a, a, a beautiful website that my website designer made and have a great team and we're rolling. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, congratulations for the launch of your book. I can't wait to actually, you know, be presenting my book to you as well, but that's... Um, I'm just in baby steps Such right now. Such a beautiful, that. worthy cause that you are engaged in, and I, you're helping so many people too. And it's wonderful to be able to share this with you. Yes. Oh my God. It's it. It really has changed my life. Um, yes. It has filled it with so much um, meaning and purpose, yes. and uh, significance. 
Yeah, and, and we all have a purpose. Yeah. And um, when when we get pulled, when our when our wounds take us in the wrong directions, we don't get to fulfill that. So when yeah. we heal, we engage, re-engage in why we're here and what our life mission you know, is. Well, I love what you just said because when we're hurting, we can't focus on our purpose. And I, as yeah. I said, I talk to so many women that they want to do so many things, but they're hurting so much. Yeah. Their only answer is that, why can't you do it? Well, I just can't. I can't. I have, yeah. you know, three kids and then I'm raising my grandkid as well. And I'm an... Um, my husband is, is unemployed and, and has so many bills. I, I can't. So it's everything. All those, all those are her purpose. Yeah. Those are her purpose. I didn't want to be born into addiction. I don't want to be an addict. And I certainly didn't want to work in the field. And guess what? My whole mission now yeah. is to share what I've learned in that journey with the entire world and save 10 million lives in the next 10 years. Yeah. And any type of addiction, right? Not just, you know, a it's substance. Really yeah. It's addiction really is... Boy. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Awesome. Well, this has been just absolutely amazing, Donna. Uh, repeat your website again. Uh, not spelled out, doctor, just drdonnamarks.com. And the name of your book? Exit the Maze. One Addiction, One Cause, One Cure. Awesome. It's in Amazon, right? Correct. Okay. I'm going to make sure that I put the link to the Amazon and to your website. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Don't go away. Okay.